story of three women and how they interpret freedom. My grandmother, Holocaust survivor Marianne Balchon, my mother, artist Vivian Rees, and myself, a neuroscientist. One begets the next, begets the next. Three women whose stories will inspire you to courage and the knowledge that you, in your life, can make a difference. We start with the story of my grandmother. My name is Marianne Balschon. I was born in Budapest, Hungary, to a nice middle-class Jewish family as their only child. I was given all the opportunity of education, dance, ballet, sports, and socializing. Life went on beautifully in my childhood. And my last celebrated birthday by parents and friends was my 16th, and after that was the end of my youth. In 1944, March 19th, the German army marched in through the bridges of Budapest, and the Nazi Germans took over the country. Adolf Eichmann was appointed as the bringer of the final solution of the Hungarian Jews. By then, most of my relatives in the provinces were taken to camps and murdered there. One morning, my father was taken from my parents' home to a gathering camp outside of Budapest, and that's when I heard that a man named Raoul Wallenberg a Swedish diplomat came to Hungary with the sole purpose of saving Hungarian Jews. He constructed a piece of paper that was like a passport, and whoever had that seemed like to belong to the Swedish crown and under the Swedish king. I got one of those papers and sent it up to my father, and lo and behold, the Gestapo honored it, and the next morning, my father was on our doorsteps, gaunt and beaten, but alive. So Raoul Wallenberg became my hero. He saved three generations of my little family. My husband by that time moved into the legation of the Swedish consulate, into the basement, and my parents moved into the Swedish house, what was under the aegis of the Swedish crown. I was kind of a liaison between all of them, trying to maintain food and whatever I could for daily existence. On New Year's Eve 1944, I decided that I cannot do that anymore, because the streets of Budapest were all war-torn, and fires, artillery fires, anti-artillery bombing, Gestapo, etc., moved on the street. So I moved in to where my husband and other so-called Haiti Jewish Swedes were in the basement. One morning I decided to go up on the second floor where we had a switchboard connecting us with Raoul Wallenberg's office. I looked out the window and I saw that a Gestapo uh, brigade came into the basement and two minutes later the whole so-called Swedish Jewish group was taken out. By then there was no camps, no wagons, and we knew they are taken to the Danube to be shut in, and the, red, the blue Danube become the red Danube. So we contacted on the switchboard Raoul Wallenberg's office, and he went out to the Danube and told these people, show your passports. Well, they didn't have it, but whatever paper they had in their pockets, they were showing. And and lo and behold, the Gestapo let them go back, and I saw them marching back into the basement. And this was the second miracle that my hero, Raoul Wallenberg, did for my little family. Towards the end, and the Russian army coming closer and closer, and towards liberation by them, Adolf Eichmann decided to blow up the ghetto where my grandfather was. Adolf Eichmann was confronted 
by Raoul Wallenberg not to blow up the ghetto. And whichever way he did it, sure enough, the ghetto was not blown up. And so my grandfather was saved. So this way Ra Raoul Wallenberg became my hero, who saved three generations of my little family. So one man can make a difference, no matter what. You can be a, make a good deed to anybody, and you can be a hero too. This is how my family was saved, and my generations that follow me were saved too. And when I decided to come to the land of the free America, and I first saw the Statue of Liberty at five o'clock in the morning in New York Harbor, I knew that my dream came true and I can live in the land of the free America. Freedom and the life you can create with it should never be taken for granted. I am an artist. Every morning I wake up and I say, hello beautiful world, and then I set out to make it an even more beautiful place. I was born in New York seven years after World War II ended, just five years after my parents saw the Statue of Liberty for the first time. That feeling kind of makes me feel so joyful that I'm crying, but I associate what my parents must have felt to be there and their newfound freedom. I was born seven years after my parents emerged from an air raid shelter to see devastation all around them. Shattered buildings, shattered lives, families missing. I remember my mother's vivid description of people in the street cutting flesh off of dead horses because they were starving. So why do I devote my life to creating joy, beauty, and freedom? It's because my parents never let me forget how precious freedom is. Freedom makes the world your canvas. People often say that in order to create art, you must suffer. But actually, the opposite is true. I remember my first artistic inspiration was a feeling of profound joy. I was about five years old, and I planted some seeds on the windowsill in, my, in New York, which was kind of dark, but it bore string beans. The excitement of a seed bearing a fruit, flower, or vegetable has never left me. A seed contains the potential of a whole growing universe. Its vitality is exhilarating. And you see that energy and movement in my paintings. Painting satisfies me as nothing else does. It satisfies my intellect, my emotions, and my connection to other people. Being an artist can sometimes be a rather lonely job, so I love painting portraits. One of the models that you've just seen said to me that sitting for me was a combination of having tea with a dear friend and seeing a therapist. <laughs> color for me is a language. When I paint, I think thoroughly in color without any words. By intermixing pure colors, line and form, I create the vi visual dynamics that people perceive as happiness, joy and movement. But painting is essentially flat. So I began to think about how could I use my knowledge in three dimensions came to me. Architecture was the answer. When I first saw my house, it was derelict and it was slated for demolition. I knew I wanted to turn it into a living object of art. People have called my house a Gesamtkunstwerk, which is a rather fancy German word for a total work of art. Now there's color from room to room that makes a space dance just like color does in my paintings. In designing, I always consider the human physical presence in the architectural space. I've been able to, to use that in about 60 more projects. Once I finished the inside of the house, I moved to the outside. In the front, in the boulevard, there used to be like a patch of kind of dry, flat grass. I had no interest in maintaining or looking at. So now my boulevard blooms with 15 high-foot broom corn, with eggplants intermingling with 
with roses. What used to be a constrained space is now a place of beauty that provides joy, happiness, and nourishment for me and my neighbors. It looks beautiful, it moves beautifully, and it tastes wonderful. <laughs> Besides my gardens being a place that brings lots of joy to people, it provides inspiration for my paintings. From each angle, nature provides thousands of relationships, which I then multiply and interpret on my canvases. My garden supplies about 140 different kinds of edibles. It's actually more like an urban farm downtown. From uh, the garden bears fruits, and from these, I create thousands of recipes and meals that I share with my family and friends. By taking photographs, I share the ephemeral and savory nature of my garden. It allows to bring to a greater audience the beautiful fleeting moments of the garden and of the morning light, which is my favorite light to photograph in. The working title of my cookbook is The Artist's Palette, but maybe it should be more aptly called Eat Your Colors, They're Good For You. <laughs> So on my last birthday, my mother called me, and I said, I'm in Savannah, Georgia, and it's so beautiful here. To which she said, but you're always surrounded by beauty because you create it around you. Joy is a very undervalued intellectual idea in the contemporary art world. It's seen as trivial rather than a deep and heroic journey that can change lives. Through my work, I've been able to bring joy, happiness, beauty, and the experience of freedom to others. But you don't have to be an artist to s turn your wildest dreams into something of a reality. Art changes the way you see the world, and the world is indeed your canvas. I was lucky enough to grow up knowing that freedom can change the way you want to see the world. <clears throat> I grew up with a mother and grandmother who inspired me from the day of birth. I grew up knowing that we all had the freedom to create the world we want to see. I would sit by my mother as she was paint, and from a blank canvas and only her imagination, an entire world would be created around us, a world of color and delight. This freedom, the freedom to create, to share, to change, was the gift that I'd been given. This freedom is the gift that I would like to pass along. I used to create in many different media, but throughout all of it, I was fascinated by the human brain. I wondered how it was that the organ inside our head could create the experience of red, or the flavor of tomato, or let you understand a friend, or even more amazingly, move your arm just like this. I wondered how it was that we had conscious control over the organ that controls us. These curiosities led me to neuroscience. I started working in a research lab where we were creating music from our minds. We'd actually take our brain activity and transform it into sound, making the intangible tangible and perceivable. This was so amazing that I thought, wow, we need to tell the world all about it. So I created a startup. I brought together my two colleagues, Chris and Trevor. We get together every week in Trevor's basement and try to bring this to the world. The first thing we wanted to do was show people the power of their own mind by letting them move physical objects with it. We created the levitating chair. As you would relax, the chair would rise to the ceiling because it would track your alpha brainwave activity. Then we thought, what's the biggest thing we can do with this? And we said, we know the Olympics. They were coming to Canada next year, so we collaborated with the Ontario government to create an installation where people could control big buildings and the lighting on them with their brain. We let people in Vancouver control the lights on the CN Tower, the Canadian Parliament Buildings, and Niagara Falls with their brain from across the country. Over the 17 days of the Olympics, 7,000 people. <laughs> 7,000 people got to extend themselves across the world with their own mind and see it projected in a large building. We thought this was incredibly amazing. We're moving stuff with our minds. 
But how can we take this technology and actually apply it to people's real challenges in their real lives? So we made Muse, the brain sensing headband. Muse is a meditation tool that helps you confront, challenge, and overcome the barriers in your own mind. It slips on just like a pair of glasses and actually tracks your brain activity in real time. There's sensors on the forehead and behind the ears, and it sends your brain data to your smartphone or tablet. It teaches you how to remain in the present moment by giving you real-time feedback on your brain activity. You can actually hear when your mind is wandering and when you're in a state of clear, focused attention. All our minds wander. It's supposed to wander, but sometimes these wanderings are to places that are not so helpful for us. Muse teaches you to take your brain back to that place of clear, focused attention. You can then track your progress on your smartphone or your tablet. Over 20,000 people have already experienced the power of Muse to help with their anxiety, stress, mood, performance. The Mayo Clinic in the US is currently using it with cancer care patients to study their stress and how to reduce it. Seed schools in Baltimore are using it with underprivileged youth to help them manage their emotions. I always love dance and movement, so one of my favorite examples is uh, Brian Orser. He is an Olympic figure skater, and he's been using Muse with the athletes that he coaches. One of them, Javier Fernandez, mused his way to gold at the Men's World Championships. Nam Nguyen. <laughs> Nam Nguyen is only 16. He came in fifth with the best performance of entire life. He was able to avoid the distractions of the crowds and the pressure of everyone to just skate cleanly and beautifully. Sometimes there are hard stories, like moving from anxious and depressive thoughts to a place of ease. Sometimes they're delightful stories, like moms being fully present with their kids at the park. 50 different institutions and research labs are currently using Muse in various studies, and we've taken a technology that was once 50 times more expensive and available only in clinics, and brought it to department stores and mainstream electronic stores, truly democratizing access to your brain. <laughs> Now, doing this was not without its challenges. We were three people in a basement when we started. The company had no money, we had no MBA, we had an unproven technology, ridiculous timelines like the Olympics, and we were telling people that you could move things with your mind and that a brain sensing headband was gonna help you manage your mental state. This was kind of inconceivable to people at the time. Now, we could have just said, this is too hard or we don't have what we need at the start, but instead, we took our vision and our desire to make this happen. And instead of internalizing those obstacles and letting them drag us down, we just pushed them away. We overcame them, we figured it out, and we turned our vision into a reality. Everybody has hardships in their life in all sorts of different forms. Wars wage on, sadly, all around us, spurned on by fear and greed and scarcity by the need to defend when not necessarily threatened, by the need to prove power when not necessarily weak. Wars also wage on inside us. The wars of, I'm not good enough, and they won't like me, and I don't think I can do that. We punish ourselves silently and loudly for our perceived imperfections, for the things we feel like we failed to do, for the people we feel we failed to please. I luckily had a little phrase that always was rolling around in my head. And that was that we all have the freedom to create whatever we want to see. When I look back on my life and what I've been able to create, I realized I had an incredible teaching, that the tangled garden of the mind does not need to be a scary place. I was able to succeed because I found freedom in my own mind. I learned from my mother and my grandmother that one person can make a difference that you have the power to change the world to whatever you want to see, that you have the power to change the world around you for the better of all. I also learned the power of the mind to change the world inside us, to move from places of limitation and distress to our natural state, which is joy and freedom. I also learned, and I'm willing to bet you, that as we reduce the wars inside us, the wars outside us may follow, and that will make the world a more beautiful place.